right. Good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing? Good. Everyone got, got their coffee, turned their phones on silent, answered their emails. All right, cool. I'm Adam. Uh, I lead a developer platform at DoorDash. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about why DPE is needed now more than ever. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, and it's unfair. But what I want to do is I want to empower everyone in this room and arm you for next year. Because we're going to face some uncertain times going into 2023. I don't know about you, but when I look at the news, <laughs> I get a little bit nervous. I see that there's a lot of companies out there that are tightening their belt. They're thinking about what are we going to do uh, going into next year. Headcount is mostly flat or across the board. And we're looking into cases where you're going to have companies that are going to want to invest in finding market fit, building out products, and typically, one of the things that is uh, at most risk is these teams like developer product engineering where we're going to be 10xing and helping on the future. So really quick, before we jump into that, I'm going to tell you about developer platform at DoorDash. So our vision is that we want to empower engineers to move quickly and confidently build a first-class developer experience built on modern, performant, and reliable platforms. Now, I don't know about you guys, when I watched all the content yesterday, I was blown away. I thought about so many things that I wanted to put on my roadmap, as well as had a huge amount of imposter syndrome seeing all the cool things that are being built across the industry right now. And I think about that, and I think about the vision that we're trying to hit, and the shared vision that everybody else in this room and in this conference is having so far. And that is so amazing to see for the first time in one of these conferences that everybody is looking towards building a lean end org that they represent. They're looking to build reliable and performant platforms that delight their customers. They're thinking about standards that are applauded and embraced versus the ones that we have to force on people. Uh, and we're also thinking about internal and external diverse communities, right? Part of our job is to bring everyone together to share those ideas, pick out the best, and also coach some of the worst, but mostly to pull everyone together. So really quick, I want to talk about the values of our developer platform organization. So we look at velocity as one of the main core tenets, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we want to move engineers as fast as possible, right? We want them to ship code quickly. We want them to not struggle with their tooling, right? That's the core of our business. But we're also concerned about quality. We want engineers uh, to have reliable systems that really are the first line and last line of defense as they build out their tools. And then, as I mentioned before, we want to drive a strong community, right? We want to embrace all the engineers that aren't on the platform teams, and we want to connect with the industry as a whole. But above all else, we think about empathy and innovation tied together. We want to find a very strong balance between the two. Because not only do we feel the pain of our engineers that they have, we're constantly coming up with solutions, but we need to drive those in pragmatic ways. So I'm going to give you a quick example about how we did that, and then I'm going to talk to how that fits into the rest. So when I first joined DoorDash, one of the biggest things that we were struggling with was gRPC, as most people have. We were running across the fact that we had just had a gigantic monolith Right? We had just decomposed it, we tore it apart, and we started creating microservices everywhere. So everyone knows the story. You know, boy meets monolith, boy destroys monolith, boy meets microservices, boy struggles with microservices. And one of the issues that we had was within our gRPC client, everyone was deviating and creating their own implementations of logging, of authentication, of retries, error handling, everything. Right? So what did we do? We came up with a standard gRPC client, and that solved everyone's problems. But everyone just cringed because we just started talking about adoption and migration. And everybody knows that the first step that you do that, you're felt, you basically just now run into a wall because everyone's busy, and it's really hard to adopt those things. Despite it fixing all the problems, people have work to do. So um, the way we tackled this is what I call the empathetic adoption cycle. Basically, we started by aligning with our stakeholders and asking them, what is your biggest pain point? How do we help you? How do we empower you? Then the next step was that we piloted and dogfooded that client first. 
we went into all the big services and we did a central migration of the gRPC clients first, understood the pain points, understood the fixes, found all the bugs, but then we were also to engender trust with those teams. Then we also helped out the little guy because what happens to all these companies is you start off with all the tier zero services, you start off with the big services that have custom stuff, but then all the other teams that are struggling because they don't have the huge army of engineers, they're the ones that we really need to help the most. They're the ones who have not only the corner cases, right, but they're the ones that oftentimes might end up being blockers around the rest of the company. So we did that at first, we got a lot of great feedback, and then we went into the growth cycle, right, which is we created a hybrid model where we had central engineers adopting the gRPC library while also continuing to push up momentum. Then we iterated, gathered feedback, and then we go back to alignment. And then every time we had a new idea or a new feature, we would start off again with that pilot and dog food. And again, that's the takeaway that I want to have, is that if you're going to come up with something, you have to have a central team that is going to get into the weeds and be on the front lines with your engineers to help them adopt and move over. So adoption is not a four-letter word. It is not something that we have to fear, right? As of now, we have 95% adoption on the Hermes gRPC client across 100 plus services. That is not something anyone predicted, and I think it was mostly due to that empathetic developer cycle as well as uh, mostly the outages that were being caused, but everyone kind of pushing for the same thing. Okay, so back to next year. So we've seen that tech orgs across the industry are gonna be facing flat on headcount, right? The adoption plans that we have, like these talked about the gRPC client, or looking at distributed testing, or getting out of the, you know, the monolith, or moving to a monorepo, those are all at risk of being paused or going stale. Uh, not only that, I don't know about everyone, my budget for vendors is, is you know, being reduced. I'm sure everyone else is the same way. And we want to buy as much as we can because we don't want to build everything, right? So we have to balance that out. Uh, and then on top of that, I know it's a bit of an elephant in the room, but engineers are leaving right? Engineers are moving around from company to company, and what happens is that not only do you have a brain drain of those established platform engineers, you're also at risk of creating a support strain for your existing platform engineers, right? Anyone who manages developer productivity engineering teams knows firsthand that the number one complaint from your engineers, besides performance reviews, is the amount of support that you have to give. It's the Slack channels, the Stack Overflow, the individual pings, the coming up to your desk in the office and asking if you have a second, right? As teams start shifting around and as you start to think about you know, playing the musical chairs, all of a sudden you're gonna put more weight on those platform teams that were working centrally. So in short, DPE is at risk to stagnate, if not implode without the right investment. So what I want to do is I want to empower everyone in the room to basically walk away with all the tools of looking at the great things that we saw from the roadmap and figuring out how do we do that in 2023. So when I talk about DPE needing investment, I typically pitch it in three ways. One, one DPE is worth 10x, right? If we develop tools and we develop standards and we empower engineers around us, that trickles out to the rest of the company. Because you create a standard, then an engineer doesn't need to implement them themselves. Or you create a tool that saves an hour of somebody's time, multiply that by every engineer. Even Gradle Enterprise, you adopt Gradle Enterprise, you save build time, saving build time, less time staring at your computer, waiting for things to get done. You walk away improving the company as a whole. On top of that, if you pause investment in DPE, you lose momentum. And as everybody in this room knows, building out platforms is a two to three year investment and sometimes just seems like a overnight success that took two years before that, right? And to get to that tipping point is tough, right? You spend six months building out the standard, another six months piloting it, finally gaining traction, and then you realize maybe there's some more investment you need to do. And at that point, if you stop investing, you stop putting on the gas, then you're gonna just hit an impasse. You're not gonna be able to continue and get past that activation energy to really take hold. The last is that these platform teams that sit at the bottom of the stack, 
really are the nexus point. And if we think about next year, with basically everyone switching around and you know, people coming out of jobs where they've been there for eight years and now they're thinking about something new, really we have a, a, a second generation, a melting pot of ideas that are going to be forming. I love when new engineers start on my team or outside of my team because they come and say, hey, I just came from Meta and this is what we were doing there, right? Or I just came from this startup and we cut through all the, the, you know, the stuff and we just got to the answer. Why don't we do that here? And you realize that sometimes the, uh, the ways that you thought were correct get changed based on who's coming in. And these platform teams are the perfect nexus point for all those engineers coming in, not into the platform teams, but even to all the product teams who want to contribute, right? So let's read the room in 2023, right? So what don't you want to do? So if you're thinking about velocity, what I would say is don't obsess with the top level KPIs. We've all heard them, we've all used them, right? I'm a huge fan of space, we use space. Uh, it's helped guide us in terms of the projects that we pick. But I remember last year, I spent, the team spent two and a half months collecting baselines across all of our systems. That's two and a half months that could have been spent building out tools that would help engineers. And going into next year, I would say focus on the macro process improvements, right? If you've heard teams you know, complain about collaboration, if you've heard teams complain about pull request review times, focus on how you can help that. Think about how you can influence all the engineers that you work with and think about the micro pain points at the same time. The build times are important, but if you have a 10,000 feet up view because you're watching the rest of the company, you can influence the rest of the company to succeed. The second on quality, uh, you cannot block product teams with draconian rules. I know, I know, I know, I know. There's always that one team that wants to introduce the brand new third party that is going to introduce a ton of security constraints because it's a binary that's bundled in and then you can't read into it. You have no idea how it's going to affect your app. I get it. I really do. But again, if you think about the empathy going into 2023, these product teams are going to be under a lot of constraints. Not only are they limited on headcount, they're being pushed to come up with new strategic initiatives and ideas. That means piloting. That means trying out. That means experimenting. That doesn't mean writing this in stone. That just means, hey, we need to get something out there. We need to iterate, right? And if you're the platform team that's blocking that, right, what's going to happen? They're just going to go around you. <laughs> you know, basically, the, the, the way that everything's set up next year, we have to embrace that. That's going to happen. So think about how you can move fast without breaking things. Think about sandbox environments. Think about nightly builds. Think about how you can cut specific customer-only builds that can get shipped out there. But think about ways of preventing the blast radius without thinking about blocking those teams. On the community side, you cannot hope that the community is just going to come together and work together. You have to incentivize them, right? Stack Overflow is great. Central Q&A is great. If it's decentralized and everyone's coming in and adding their support, right? If you have just have one team that's answering the questions all the time, that's going to burn them out. And it's not really going to empower engineers to find the own answers themselves. So you have to figure out how to incentivize that community. I'm not going to say exactly how to do it. I think every company is going to be different. Some companies have done kudos. Some companies have said, if you don't do it, it's going to be bad on your performance review. Uh, but I think everyone can find a good balance to basically let engineers know it's everyone's problem. We have to come together and we have to solve these problems together. In the last, and I think the most important one, coming out of the conference this week is thinking about empathy and innovation together. 2023 is not the year to prioritize moonshots, right? Now, okay, that doesn't mean don't invest in the brand new technology, don't adopt what you want to adopt, but it's an incredibly hard sell and it's going to be taken not in the best way that you want it to if you go to the rest of the company and say, Drop everything you're doing. I know Kotlin's great, but we're switching to Fortran. Let's go, right? I think the rest of the company is going to take a step back and say, no, 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 we don't have time for that. 
So instead, what you should be thinking about is how do we enable and support all the teams that rely on us? One aspect that I loved that, that we invented at, or not invented, but employed at Uber, uh, which was great, was our embedding program. So we had platform engineers that would sit with product teams, actually use the tools and frameworks that we created for once, uh, understand all the gaps, and then bring all that data back to the platform team. This is great for so many reasons. One, like I said, a lot of times we actually create tools and we don't get to use them. I love the IntelliJ folks talking about dogfooding, all their own stuff, but it's pretty rare, because if you're on the Android platform team, it's pretty rare that you're going to write a product feature. If you're on your CI team, are you the ones who are sitting and waiting for your build to finish compiling? No. So a lot of times getting into this embedding program allows you to actually work with the tools and frameworks that you're producing for sometimes the first time for these engineers. The second part is that it engenders a lot of trust with those teams, right? Because you can go to those teams and you can say, hey, we're on the front lines with you. We're working hand in hand with you. You get to develop those connections, especially in all these remote environments where we don't see people day to day. But it gives us a chance to actually connect the dots between all those teams. And then the last part is you should think about pragmatic, small iterations that work towards a longer vision, right? But you think about all those incremental steps that you can make. So let's see, what is this? No, I think you're there, OK. Was that Ruse trying to find his phone? OK, I think he's good. Um, so lastly, uh, well, no, here we go. Your Apple ID, OK. I'm an Android user, so it's definitely not me. I just split half the room in terms of <laughs> going with me or not. Oh, sorry, I split 75% of the room using iPhones <laughs> going with me or not. 90%. Uh, OK. Uh, <laughs> right, here we go again. I think yesterday, it is much better than that buzzing uh, a lot like airport door yesterday. So I think we'll take it with the dialogue. OK, the last little bit, working on small pragmatic innovations. You don't need to do the moonshots, but you can start working in that direction. 2023 is not going to last forever, right? At most, it'll last a year, right? But then we'll get to the next stage, and we'll start going back with more technology. So if everyone comes back and works out of this conference with all those ideas and that excitement and that optimism, but then thinks about how to roll it into the roadmap and thinks about how to really embed with the other teams. Look at the longer KPIs, but don't focus on, like, don't, don't obsess about them. Don't block. But if you work together and you come up with that pragmatic solution, I guarantee you, you're going to be able to get the, all the investment you want and see all the rewards and all the gains that you've worked for years to try to get. Okay. Thanks all.